Where are we? When one observes this realm without expectations or filters, one realizes eventually that at its core is a competition, a conflict, as mentioned in the previous presentation. Each and every being set onto this place is forced, in one way or another, to mind that competition if it is to survive. From the smallest animal to the largest, all have to consider food, some form of shelter, and ways to compete not only with other species, but also with elements of their own. Even plants have to deal with each other to meet their requirements, be them sunlight, nourishment, reproduction opportunities. So, somewhere at its basic layer, there is a contradiction in the world's mind, so to speak calibrating the minds that are generated from it. So, every mind of every creature brings with it this duality of seeking a stability of peace and plenty, but always having to deal with the conflict of competition and scarcity the defeated are given. If one is to consider this from a perfect creationist point of view, it makes no sense. As realized before, perfection is unable to create imperfection. However, when one observes deeper in the layers of the world's mind, one finds an underlying frustration exactly because of this. The frustration is that creation here was supposed to be something that it is not, and also its enemy, reflection or shadow, or if you prefer its opposition, was not supposed to exist either. If you are an architect and engineer in this world, and you decide to design and build an eternal structure, capable of withstanding time eternally, able to resist everything that the realm will periodically throw at it, frustration will be your outcome. Still, your intentions may be pure. You wanted to build something that would, in that sense, transform the world and remove it from its competitive element. Yet to go about it in that way would be the same as trying to shield your own creation from what continuously tries to take it down, while ignoring or disregarding the reasons why it is being continuously attacked in the first place. If you are a perfect architect and a perfect engineer, then why is everything you build eventually crumbling in time or being demolished by those who hate you and your buildings. If you are perfect, then why are you subject to time? And, most importantly, why are you hated? Pride is at the very beginning of this crazy dream, and, as was also presented before, shame is always its counterpart. The pride of considering oneself a perfect creator and of, consequently, banishing the evidence of imperfection that shames one so much, is at the core of the realm's mind. So it creates and at the same time it attacks its creation. It makes things seemingly eternal, only to witness them crumble eventually. Imagine the frustration. And we can, as in most of our lives we've had to face in one way or another, from a prideful or shameful point of view, this same contradiction. The realm's mind first statement must have been, I am perfect. And since then, it has been faced with its shadows that reflected off its imperfect nature. These reflections shame that mind because it considers itself perfect, but they are merely being its mirror. Again, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who in this land is fairest of all? And when the mirror shows an imperfect reflection, or at times an outright ugly visage, especially if it's early morning, right guys? <laughs> then the world's mind, who already invested its self-image into being perfect, is frustrated and ashamed. Pride always feeds shame, and shame always generates more pride. They are interdependent. This cycle can only be broken by the humility of accepting that even an overwhelmingly beautiful being is imperfect, with that humility removing the pride from the mind. 
As the pride is removed, then the shame fades away, consequently, and as the shame dissolves together with its counterpart pride, so does the original imperfection. So, in essence, all that is maintaining the conflict at the most basic layer of the world's mind is the original pride that generates its ugly reflection and, of course, the unwillingness to accept its faults with true humility. As soon as that humility would be truly attained, the ugly reflections would be then transmuted in the mirror and the world's mind would have been saved from the conflict with its own reflected demons. When I contemplate on the world's mind here, it is not my intention to talk about someone else that I am detached from, especially not in a judgmental way. All of us here who have a connection to life are a fragment of that shattered mind, and so, holographically, because a hologram will always show the entire original object even at its smallest projections, we also have that mind with all its conflicts and reflections, only at a smaller scale. We have a smaller inner world, comparatively, and the external world we can influence is also much more limited, but we carry with us the potential tones of that same mind. I leave a warning here not to confuse this with the idea that we are all one, we are not all one, but all of us are potential aspects of one. To say that we are all one is, again, to deny that we are fragments, to deny that there are reflections of our imperfections, to deny, therefore, that we are imperfect, and, like it happened originally to the realm's mind, to deny our pride because it shames us. To say we are all one is pride, because it accepts only the differences among the elements of that all that do not bring shame to the one, rejecting any other differences contrary to the preferred image on the mirror. Of course, as always has been, such self-deceit will not last and will crumble time and time again making the shame visible in all its ugliness, in the same way that all the noble lies applied even with the best intentions have also been destroyed or will be. The monster hates Victor Frankenstein because the doctor is pridefully ashamed of what the monster reflects about himself and has, as such, rejected and abandoned him. So the monster attacks everything that is dear to Victor because it was all built on illusions of perfection. Victor saw himself as a perfect creator and all that was pleasant to him in his life worked to confirm him that. The monster he created reflected otherwise and began to consume like bacteria and fungi eat the accumulated poisons that make up tumors all the toxic illusions held by his creator, bringing him down to a forced humiliation. Which is not humility, this must be said, but instead a consequence of a shame that grew so powerfully that pride is no longer able to evade it. Humility is a moral choice. Humiliation is the consequence of continuously refusing to even consider it. Like the Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa, using his heteronym Ricardo Reis, wrote, Reality is always more or less of what we want. Only ourselves are always in accordance with ourselves. So we are all placed as fragments of a shattered mind, looking at the shards of our individual mirror all the while also reflected by the underlying original mind's mirror we are all affected by. This original mind first wanted us to be perfect, to be its pride and joy. When we were unable to do so, to be so, having been made imperfect, and we listened to the mind's dark reflections, the realm's mind blamed it on the shadows. 
which is something we also do so often. To blame the reflection on the mirror when it is our actual image shown there. Not the way we edit that image with makeup and delusion when we pridefully look in self-deceit. The shadows and reflections of the original mind first humiliated it when they showed how its creations were imperfect. It all started there. It may seem simple on paper, but a mere, oh, this is silly, they are not perfect because I am not perfect, I am sorry, would probably have solved it right there and then. But, as we know all too well, we need a relatively long time of grinding until we are able to even consider putting pride and shame aside. Now imagine how long the realm's mind needs. So here we are. The only thing we can do is our best to restore our fragment. Truth and life is always there, timeless, perfect, immutable, beyond the world's mind, working its therapy. And this therapy involves us and the moral choices we make when we look at the mirrors that surround us. The world's scripts, whichever they may be, only trap us if they still reflect what we identify with. Morally choose each day. Cast your vote silently and unmoving with your inner world. There is nothing we have to do, but sometimes we need to do something like a dog needs to feel happy chasing a stick.